All right. Praise Jesus. Family Day. Love Family Day. We're starting a new series of sermons over the next several weeks. It's called uh, Real Relationships. And so uh, we, it, we changed the letters on the real so you didn't think it was me making a spelling mistake. But we want real relationships. We ready to go? You got those slides up there for me? Boom. There it is. So see the real? So we want real relationships. You got relationships where we want real relationships. So you saw a couple of slides about Jamaica, but I got a couple more slides for you. How many had an awesome Valentine's Day? You got everything you wanted. You're blessed. How many like really celebrate Valentine's Day? You, you get special stuff, do things, and do stuff for your sweetie and all that stuff? We, we really don't so much, eh? I don't know why. Is that my fault? It's my fault. All these years you've said, yeah, does it really matter? It matters? It matters? Oh, my God. It's been like 37 years. Ouch. <laughs> Sorry. I, I'm sorry. Anyway, got a couple of little uh, uh, cards, a little uh, Valentine wishes from children. I don't know if you can see them there. This was a little hard to see, but it, it's from Emma K. And Emma K. said, what is love? What is love? Love is when you're missing some of your teeth, but you're not afraid to smile because you know your friends will still love you even though some teeth are missing. Hey, come on. Everybody missing some teeth, say amen. All right. All right, here's Brandon. Brandon said, thank you, Mom, for making me food so I don't die. I said, you got to know that's awesome right there. All right, dear Mommy, you are nice, funny, and you love me, and I know your hormones are crazy, but I didn't mind because you still love me. I don't even know what that means. I really don't. I, don't, I think I might have experienced it, but I don't, I don't. Dear Mom, I love you. You're doing a good job not burping at the bus stop. Happy Valentine's Day. Did anybody's mom burp at the bus stop? It's kind of embarrassing. You know, you're, hey, how are your kids doing? Bah! You know, no, no. That would be rough. Hey, thanks, thanks, Mom. Thanks, Mom, for not burping. I think I got one more. This is, this is awesome right here. It's, uh, there it is right there. Oh, let, me, let me find the words. I can't read it. Well, it's, happy Valentine's Day, baby. <laughs> I didn't know it meant that much, but uh, okay, I love this. It says, you are a beautiful human being, and I'm not good at drawing human beings, so I drew a potato instead, <laughs> but a very beautiful potato. <laughs> uh, that's fun. Isn't that fun? You know, it's funny. I don't know if you've watched little kids as they develop in their drawing, but they all start drawing like potato people. Have you noticed that? I think that's why they had little Mr. Potato Head. My, my granddaughter, Frankie, was over last Monday, and she was drawing a picture of me. And uh, uh, just like your mother, she drew this great big circle, stuck little stick hands off and things. And I don't know, maybe that does resemble me a bit. I don't know. But, but uh, anyways, it's all good. Hey, relationships. We want to talk about relationships. We're going to start. And we're actually going to hang our hat in the book of uh, Philippians. So we're going to do this all out of the book of Philippians, all right? So Philippians chapter 1, verse 8. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start out of the first of chapter 2 because I think that's what Paul really hangs, you know, the whole meaning of his letter to the Philippians on. So Paul writes to this church. He says, Paul writes with great affection. Thank you. I mean, this is where he wants to continue to express, wants the church to continue to express his life. This is not an epistle where he's dealing with false doctrines. He's not coming against Gnosticism or, or one of these issues like his other letters where we're helping them and teaching them and very doctrinal and, you know, be careful of this, be careful of that. But here's a church that literally, he was just writing them saying, you know, here I am in prison and I'm at the end of my journey here in prison. And you know what? I'm praying for you and I'm thinking about you and I wanted to write you this letter because I'm so grateful for you. And every time I think about you, it just gives me incredible joy. And he wrote a letter just to encourage them and to share with them and enjoy them. And it's a letter, I think, I think it's a letter about relationships. And so we're going to talk about relationships out of Philippians. I love this. Verse 1, chapter 1, verse 8. And listen now, like if, if I said I, I've got something to share with you and I've got a witness with me as well just to witness that what I'm saying is true. Like you might bring a witness. If you're sharing something in court, do you have any witnesses? You'd say, yeah, what I said is true. This person witnessed it as well. So I love that Paul is saying, God God is my witness. Well, who's your witness, Paul, that you really mean what you're saying? God is. Like the Almighty. He is the witness of what I'm saying. But look what he says. Paul says about these people, he says, I want you to know, and God is my witness, how I greatly long for y'all. He must have been from the South, Paul, hey? Because he longed for y'all. I long for y'all. He says, I greatly long for y'all. But listen to what he does. He says, God is my witness that I long for you with the affection of Jesus Christ. 
said, I'm, I tell you, I'm baptized in the love of God and his affection overwhelms me and I long for you. I long to manifest the affection of Christ over you and God is my witness. We got to be a community that manifests intense, really strong, real, intentional love. Can I get an amen? All right. So in my parents' generation, my dad, it was if something got broken, you had to fix it. All right. So it's right here on the slide. See? In my parents' generation, when something broke down, you fix it. You didn't buy a car, you know, every two years like I do. I don't know why. I just, it's, I don't know. But back then, if something broke down, you would try and fix it. You would, first of all, try to do that. Now, I never got under the hood of a car with my dad. I never tried to fix a washing machine or, or do any plumbing. Never stuck my head under a sink. Never, ever did any of that. My dad, if you needed to fix it, you went in the yellow pages, and that's how we fix stuff. So I'm a yellow page guy. Cheryl, not so much. She tries to fix things, and then we call a real professional. So anyways, but... <laughs> But, you know, it's sad that this generation, that's the way I am. I'm kind of, if it's broken, let's get a new one. The TV starts to go wonky. There's new ones. Let's get the new one. You know, it's like the new iPhone comes out. Let's get the new one. This one isn't, isn't charging quick enough. I mean, we always want to replace. And that's kind of sad. We don't want to do that all the time. So we can get a little, little bit of Jenga. Can you help me with Jenga? This is Jenga. How many people, don't, how many people played Jenga? You've done Jenga? How many people like Jenga? Is it Jengwa? Is that what it is? You call it Jengwa? I mean, anyway, I, I don't like, I really don't like a lot of, mostly because when I play games with Cheryl, she beats me all the time. And when I do win, it's obnoxious when I win because they don't win a lot, so I have to be really, really win. I brought Jenga up here because, uh, you know, relationships should be whole. They really should be. But, you know, stuff happens in life. So sometimes, you know, things happen. Don't touch. Oh, so you know, things happen, like you get a, an issue, you get a disagreement with each other and something goes on and, you know, things get popped out. And, you know, you need to resolve those things. You need to really make sure things are still together. You need to keep your relationships real. You need to keep them solid. You know, sadly, what happens, though, is we go through life, we go through things and stuff happens and we, instead of dealing with it, we let it go. And, and if you keep on letting things go and you don't kind of work on it, you don't replace things, suddenly the whole thing gets a bit Jenga. You know, is, what do they call it? Is it a Yankee or I, Jane, yeah. <laughs> you know, But you keep on going like that. And, you know, you can have wonky. Wonky is a good word. But look, it's starting to go wonky. You know, the more you have issues and things that happen that affect your relationship, if you don't address those things and those start to work on those things, uh, you know, it's going to start to get a bit messy. And a lot of people's relationships start to look like this. And you need to stop right there and you need to go, ouch. You don't not address stuff. A lot of times, you, there's a lot of times I know people, I've been with them, I'm hanging out with them, and everything looks good, everything looks fine, and then all of a sudden, you know, the whole thing fell apart, but that's what we didn't see. Already, it started to look a bit like this, and we didn't know, but out on the, on the, on the surface, everything still looked pretty much okay, but we didn't realize there was a lot of unresolved issues. There were financial issues, disagreements, arguments about the kids, this or that, or, or one of the kids got a bit wonky in the relationship, but that was causing some grief, and you know, there's this whole brokenness going on, but you know, somewhere in here, we got to stop. Up, and we got to put this thing back together. We got to work on it. We got to restore it. And we want real, whole, wonderful relationships in our community. Cheryl didn't do this good in the first service, but you're doing pretty good here. I know. But are you having fun? Because you're eating into my time now. <laughs> While she's doing this, let me just say Shirley Parent has been a part of our church since uh, the first summer. So that is what happens if you don't address things eventually. That happens. Then we all go, oh, I didn't even know they were having problems. But there was Jenga. There was stuff going on. And if we don't address it, that's what happens. But back to Shirley. Shirley going to turn 82 this week, which is a little crazy. huh? And, uh, you know, Shirley, when we came here, Cheryl, Cheryl and I led worship. I played on the drums with a microphone and Cheryl played on the guitar. Cheryl played in the key of G and sang in the key of F. I don't even know how she did it, but she was skilled at it, and I would shout from the drums, sing, Cheryl, sing, and we just did it and stuff, but when I was away, 
whenever I went away, the worship leader was Shirley Parent. She was the worship leader and she'd stand up, she'd lead worship if I went away. Those were awesome days. Shirley was also our first administrator. She worked in the office, made the bulletins, did stuff and worked with me in the office and she survived pretty much. And, uh, but you know, 82 years old, that's pretty amazing. I can't even believe it myself, you know, but, but happy birthday, bless you. And I'm just so blessed by what you're doing. Better days ahead and stand up right now so we can acknowledge you. In Jesus' name. All right, you're getting better every day. Happy birthday, Shirley. Bless you. All right, so Jenga, right? You know, like this is what goes on. We don't want that to go on. All right, I'm going to show you these quotes again. I know I showed them to you a couple weeks ago, but they're so strong I want to show them again because they're all about relationship. And this is uh, Dr. Uh, Dean Ornish. Ornish Lifestyle Medicine. He said, love and intimacy and our ability to connect with ourselves and others is at the root of what makes us sick and what makes us well. This is Dr. Ornish in his research, all right? He said, it's at the root of what makes us sick and what makes us well. People who feel lonely and isolated have a 300 to 500% greater risk of premature death due to physical illness. And there's people even in relationships, and you might be in the relationship, but it's sad when you find out later that there was a relationship, but it had already become fractured. And it might have been people living in the same house or even living in the same world, but there was already incredible fractures and things that had been pulled out, things that were missing and fragments there. And you know, if you don't reach out and you don't say we got to do something, it's going to collapse and it's going to get messy. So we want to make sure we have real relationships and things are working out well. So relationships, love and intimacy, it's the root. It is the root of what makes us well and what makes us sick. Another quote, this is actually from a, a study, uh, Harvard's uh, study uh, from Grant and Gluck. Grant and Gluck study, they did a study. They tracked the physical and emotional well-being of 500, 456 poor men in Boston from 1939. And then uh, also 268 male graduates from Harvard. It was a 75-year study and they followed these lessons lives. And I am not going to read you the whole study, but here's a massive conclusion. Here's the conclusion. You ready? After all that study, all the research, compiling all that they saw and all the evidence, when they pulled it all together, they came to this conclusion. Here's what Robert Waldinger, director of Harvard's study of adult development, adult development. See, as adults, you need to develop. I'm very sad when I see people, they become an adult, they stop reading, they stop growing, they stop learning, they stop building on who they are as a person, they stop, you know, digging deep and pulling out the significance of who they are, because there's a lot in you that you got a responsibility to bring out, and adults need to develop. Just turn to your neighbor, get nasty, point at them and say, you could develop. Okay, good, good, that was good. All right, the clearest message of what we got from this 75-year study is this. It's this, it's the clear message that we get, is this, that good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. That's it. I mean, period, drop the mic, done, that's over. It's all about happy, healthy, clear relationships are what is really working on your life. Whatever you're going through in life, there's this elevator music going on of, of either broken relationships or sound, healthy things that are moving you forward in life. Can I get an amen? All right, good, good. So we're going to mess with you a little bit. We're going to talk about relationships out of the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. If you want to go there, I got it up on the screen. Don't want you to get lazy, though. You should go to your Bibles. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 it says this. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there's any comfort from love, if there's any participation in the Spirit, all rhetorically speaking, because there is, if there's any affection and sympathy, complete my joy. If there's any of this provision in Christ, if you've got any of this because of your relationship with Jesus Christ, if there is any, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing. Say nothing. nothing. Don't do a single thing. Go ahead. Give me another slide. Do nothing. Do nothing. Nothing. Does anybody know what nothing is? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you, or each of you here, every single one of you here, this is for you. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is for you. Turn to your other neighbor and say, you're my second choice, but I'm seriously thinking about you. But 
All right, let each of you look not only on his own interests, but also to the interests of others. This is Paul talking about relationships, talking about, I love you guys. I'm so blessed for you. I'm thankful for you. I hold you in my heart. But if all I want to do to my family is I want to encourage you, make sure that that love that's been poured in your heart is being expressed to each other. Be of one mind. Be of one heart. Be of one understanding with one another. And do everything you can to put others ahead of yourself. He says, this is going to cost us. Let each of you look not to his own interests, interest, but to the interests of others. Here we go. Boom. Verse 5. Verse 5. Here it is. Verse 5. I mean, I could drop the whole mic right here. We could say, service over. Who would like that? How many know it's not going to happen? All right. Verse 5. In your relationships. This is the NIV. I, I like the way they laid this out. In your relationships. Who's got a relationship? Who's in some? Who was alone on Valentine's and wants one? There's prayer after the service. All right. So in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. Bam. Hello. If we would make sure and insist every moment of the day that we approach every other person in our world and we treat them with the mindset of Jesus Christ, oh my goodness, story's over. Beautiful thing. I think we'd have world evangelism. I think the whole world would be saved if the body of Christ would really embrace a Christ mindset towards others and towards themselves. I think, boom, drop the mic. The English Standard Version, same verse says this, have this mind among yourselves. Have this mind. Have this, this approach to life. Be thinking your thoughts are what shapes you. As you think, so you are. So your thinking has to be paramount and you got to don't waste your mind think on purpose think intentionally have this mind among yourselves which is yours i love that translation he's not saying get it not try to have it he said there is a mind that you possess corinthians says we have the mind of christ so he says there's a mind that you have there is a mind that is knocking at the door there is a mind that says i'm here i'm ready to manifest everything that will bring you happiness and health and life he's there he is ready to invade every aspect of your life he's there let them in. You have this mind. It's yours. Have this mind that you have in Christ Jesus. Verse 6. Verse 6 says, who through and though he was in the form of God, did not count, there it is, counting, and he did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself of taking the form, and he took the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of a man, and being found in human uh, form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient even to the death, the death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. Don't you like that? In James, it says, if you humble yourself, God will exalt you. And that's really what Jesus did. Jesus came and he, he, he gave up the, he didn't stop being God. He was every bit God. He couldn't stop being God. But what he did was the privileges of God. Out, out of glory, out of that realm, he stepped down. And he, it's not as much what he gave away, it's what he took on. It's the, it's the theology called kenosis. It's what he took on. He took on humanity. He could never stop being God, but God became a man, and he took that on. He became a man, and when he did that, he did that so that he could be highly exalted, and what was bestowed, bestowed upon him was the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, Paul's like, I want you to have the same mind of Christ. And then he explains it. Then he says, let me, let me help you get your head around what it is that Jesus did and that example that I would like you, not just to follow the example, but I'd like you to embody what he has provided for you. It's not an example to follow. It's a provision that's already been given that you need to let go and let it be manifest in your life. Now, I had a little quote from C.S. Lewis. It's back up maybe in my slides a little bit there. Uh, C.S. Lewis. You got that one? In the Christian, I love this. C.S. Lewis said, in the Christian story, God descends to reascend. I mean, the reason he came down was to go back. He, he didn't come just to, to give his life. He came so that he could, he could reach out and touch and become human so that he could ascend. And so that he, could, he comes down, down to the very roots and seabed of the nature he has created. But he goes down to come up again to bring the whole ruined world up with him. See, he didn't just die. You died. And he wasn't just raised. You were raised. 
You literally right now, you are dead to sin. You are done. It's all done away with all the miserable uh, misunderstanding and, and, and everything that blocked you from a relationship with God. You are dead, dead to sin, done, finished once and for all. But not only that, you are risen with him and you are seated with him relationally, clearly, absolutely bound up with Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Could never get closer to God than you are right now because he raised you up and he placed you in him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Wow, it's such an amazing relationship. But God did that. He came and he ascended into our mess so he could lift us up into his glory. And tell you folks, that is finished. It's done. And we need to walk in it today. And Paul is saying, wow, in this massive lofty language, the kenosis about, about what Jesus did, a beautiful early church hymn. He is saying from that early church hymn, that's how I want you to relate with other people. Is anybody going to say, ouch, or is it just me? Because, wow, that's a massive, massive standard. But the standard that he demands of us with each other, he provided for us. He's not asking us to try to do something we couldn't do. He placed him in us, in Christ. The Godhead, the fullness of it, dwells in us in bodily form, and we are complete in him. We're not missing a thing. Everything the gospel demands, the gospel has already provided. And it's not something you strive for. It's something you let manifest in your life because it is, from beginning to end, a work of God. So our relationships have to be... <laughs> thank you. That's true. It's true. Our relationships should be awesome. That's all I'm saying. They really, really should. They should be awesome. So let's try and just unpack that one little bit more. Are you ready? I spent last night, man, about... Got home from Toronto. spent four hours at the kitchen table just trying to outline this passage just a little bit. And I wanted to do it in a way that you could remember it. So healthy relationships happen when? Healthy relationships happen when? When, Pastor, when? He emptied himself. Now he emptied himself. He didn't stop being God. So what do you mean he emptied himself? I mean, what did he really do? God did not operate out of the privilege of being God. He was absolutely God, did not stop being God. But he didn't live out of the privilege of God. He didn't say, I'm God, shut up. When he made a three-legged stool and it had a bit of a quirk on it, and somebody said, I'm not paying you for the stool, it's wonky. He knew it wasn't wonky. He knew it was perfect. But he went, gosh, you're awesome. He didn't say, do you know who you're talking to who made that stool? He never, he never was, you know, living out of the... You never felt when you were around him that, oh, I'm not worried to be in your presence, Jesus. You are God. You are so awesome. He was your friend. He was hanging out with you. He was somebody who knew cared about you more than you cared about yourself. You felt good to be around him. He, you felt loved when you're around him. He didn't operate of, I am God, follow me. I mean, there was something interesting about how he gave up all of those rights and he didn't live out of that. He did not give up on his rights as God. He gave up on his rights to enjoy the rights of God. Jesus absolutely modeled for us and manifest for us as a man what it would be like to absolutely, totally, completely yield to the Father in everything you do. And he did it. He did it. Every moment of his life, he knew how to yield totally to the Father, and he knew how to put other people before himself and love them. So number one, you're going to have healthy relationships when you got to let go. If you got some big, high, lofty opinion of yourself and you're right all the time, and that's probably me 28 days out of the month. Oh, you're preaching to yourself, Pastor. Well, doesn't everybody have a little bit of pride, do you? Every once in a while, you just think you're right, and it's got to go your way, and da-da-da. But you know, here's the problem. I am right. But you know what? Sometimes you can be right, and you can be wrong. Sometimes you can be right, but you, you push your rightness above the person who's in front of you, and you enforce your rightness on that person instead of saying, my rightness doesn't matter right now. What's more important than my rightness is the person in front of me. And that relationship is way more important than am I right about the situation. You know, when we do that, we really mess up. And if you're like that, and I am sometimes, say amen. I'm glad there wasn't too many amens. There, were, there was a couple of I knows, but anyways. And you gotta, you gotta let go, say let go. Healthy relationships happen when you let go. Number two, number two. Healthy relationships happen when you go low. Just say thank you. You don't even know why. Let go, go low. You feeling me now? No? Not so much. Okay. 
Wow, I tried so hard with this too. But here's what it says. What did he do? He, he then, not only did he do that, but he took on the form of a servant. I love in the upper room when Jesus is going to commission these guys. High five, it's your turn. Fill the earth with my message. Disciple the nations. High five. Go ahead, guys. You know, and then what does he do? The first act he does to introduce that is he puts on, he takes off and he disrobes himself and he puts on an apron and he washes everybody's feet. And he gets to Peter. Peter goes, no, no, don't wash my feet. I'm not worthy. Peter says, if you don't understand this, if you don't let me do it, you don't have any part with me. Oh, never mind then. Give me the full massage. Give me the full shower. You know, the way up, the way forward, the way to realize your purpose is your destiny is to serve. Say serve. serve. Say it a lot. Put it on your fridge. Put it on the, your mirrors. Put it, put it on your dashboard. Just put it central in your life. You know what? Serve is what Christianity is all about. And it's about putting others before yourself. More significant than what he let go is what he became. He became human and being found in human form, he absolutely, totally, completely identified with us. You know, do you know that in most people that you run into, there's a backstory? Can you say backstory? Sometimes you can get annoyed with people. You can go through things. Have you ever once in your life ever had a situation where you, you, you enforced your will in a situation, but then you found out that the person you were dealing with, the backstory was horrible. The backstory was ugly. And, you know, that person was going through such incredible things. And, and I didn't treat that person as a human having the experience and going through a journey. I just treated them as an object that I was interacting with, and I was enforcing what I wanted to see done. And I never really saw past to see that there's a person with real experiences. And please take the time to make sure that you go low. Make sure that you recognize that every person in front of you, you have a responsibility to love on and to serve and to bless first and foremost. You're dealing with real people and they're having real lives. And we want to have real relationships. How are you doing? Are you guys okay? Man, I tell you, let this attitude be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Well, if we could get that done and we can because he made it happen, what would community look like? Thank God this one already looks like that. This is just a, a warm-up and a reminder. All right, so that was good. Let go, go low. Say let go. Say go low. Let go, go low. Boom. Let go of having to have things your way all the time. And then go low. Look at the people in front of you. Think of ways that you can humble yourself and you can serve them. You ready? Number three, say three. Okay, now here it is. Let go. Okay. Go low, do mo. Thank you. All right, see, I'm going to Jamaica, so I'm practicing to get ready because, you know, say, Pasa, got some rice here. Yeah, give me mo. <laughs> give me mo, man. No? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Really healthy relationships happen when you let go, when you go low, and when you do more. Count others more significant than yourselves. The person in front of you is more significant than you. Wow. Every single person I run into, I esteem them and who they are as better than me. Every person. Wow. So that's absolute complete humility. I love that because if you humble yourself, he will exalt you. If you don't, he will humble you, and he's a professional humbler. So, 1 John 3.16, not John 3.16, but 1 John 3.16, by this we know love. We know love that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to. Now, ought, ought in the Greek is D-E-I, and it's a word that means we are legally responsible to, we are legally bound to do this. It's where Jesus went into the a synagogue and he saw uh, the person with the withered arm and he says, man, I got to heal you today. And he says, I ought to heal you. He said, I am literally bound. I am responsible to release the kingdom right now and to heal you. You know what? You ought to think of others as more significant than yourself. And that's real humility when we ought to lay down our lives. Lay down our lives. Lay down our lives for our brothers. Amen. Hey. Hey, what would church look like? What kind of community? I'd say people would be pressing into a community like that. People would be going, man, I want to be there. It's a place where when you come, you can't, when do we get to meet again? When do I get to hang out with you guys more? 
because there's something genuine really and there's the very life of God that is being released in each of us and we feel that incredible loving community okay so we gotta let go we gotta go low we gotta do mo number four you gotta say low how many think I'm stretching a lot on this one? <laughs> All right. So when you say Lord, things, things go better when you say Lord. They really do. He says he highly exalted him and he gave him the name above every name, that in the name of Jesus, every tongue should confess, every knee is going to bow. But you know, when everyone is walking in that realm of we're saying Jesus is Lord, if Jesus is the Lord of your life and Jesus is the Lord of my life, I tell you, what we get there, what do we get? We get the whole thing, every knee, every tribe, every tongue, every single person is saying, let the peace of the kingdom of God rule where we are. And I want peace. I want, and not, not peace where, I don't want truce. I want, well, you annoy me, stay away from me. I want peace where there's absolute wholeness, reconciliation. There's true, authentic, real relationships going on. So you know what? You, you uh, have to let go. You got to go low. You got to do mo, And you got to say low. Say Lord. I know that was a stretch, but it was 12 o'clock at night and I said, good enough. You know what? Christ, every place, every peace, every person, kingdom. Let me take a little quick little turn. I'm going to go to uh, John chapter 4. Boom, right here. John chapter 4. I love this story because you got the woman at the well, right? Now here's the woman wrecked, relationships wrecked. She said all kinds of relationships. And Jesus sends the fellows in to go get some lunch. They're already freaked out because what are we doing in Samaria? And a Samaritan woman comes at the middle of the day. And at the middle of the day, she's there getting water because she doesn't want to see anybody. All my relationships are wrecked. I'm wrecked. I don't even want to be in community with a single person. I want to be alone. And suddenly there's Jesus sitting on the well. Now this is awkward because I got to get stuff out of the well. And what's this guy doing sitting on the well? This is awkward. <coughs> But he's sitting on the well. And like he's saying, lady, you're not going to avoid me. I mean, we're, we're having an encounter. And then she finally says, oh, for Pete's sake. So she goes to draw her says, give me a drink. Are you kidding me? I had Mercy the other night. Mercy, where's Mercy? There she is. Mercy had a coffee. I said, Mercy, can I have a drink of your coffee? She went, no way. I said, that's unbelievable. I just wanted to be close to you, intimate with you. And she wouldn't let me drink out of her cup, which is good, because I have cooties. But anyways... <laughs> I don't even know what cooties are, but anyway. Uh, here's Jesus saying, give me a drink out of your cup. She's like, are you kidding me? I'm a Samaritan. You're a, a Jew, obviously some kind of rabbi or teacher or whatever. But I mean, are you, this is silly. And, but you know, they have this little dialogue. But I want you to see this. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, say gift of God. If you knew the gift of God and who it was that saying this to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. He says, but whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. And you see, when Paul's asking us to live out of this life, he's saying when you take of the gift of God, when you drink deeply of the satisfaction of your relationship with God, when you live out of your relationship with him, when you take on and release in you the mind of Christ, you will never be dissatisfied. You're never a person who's trying to take from a relationship. You're never somebody who's broken by expectations or something else. You're someone who is so completely satisfied with the only one who can satisfy you, and it's the gift gift of God to have complete absolute life and when you drink out of his cup you're not looking for other people would you pour into me would you please pour into me oh please pour into me you don't have to do that anymore because you've got a well of living water gushing out of you all your needs are met and you can be somebody who pours your life out and puts other people ahead of yourself because you are so satisfied by that one relationship that fills every void in your life one more slide boom acceptance, identity, security, and purpose, every one of those is met in Christ. And if you're not getting those met in Christ, you're going to see that every other person is an opportunity for you to fulfill yourself. Every other person is an opportunity to you for you to get your needs met. You know me, I'm a needy preacher. Please say amen. amen. I'll go home and say, Cheryl, they didn't say enough amends. I'm just not satisfied with myself as a preacher. Why can't they just throw me a ball? Amen. All I want is an Amen. But you know what? I don't care. All my needs are met in Christ. But you could still say amen. Amen? Amen. amen. But you know what? All, every bit of it. Only God meets your deepest needs in life. And only when you live out of that, only when you are baptized in the gift of God, only then can you let go. Go low. Do more. Because you said, 
He is love. 